it depends on the actor. Some most actors just want to be stars. I wanted to be a star. That's why I came to to Hollywood. Um, but then it morphs, and then I just loved performing. Um, Bill switched something on in my mind and my soul that that uh, I still to this day espouse. You know, having fun up there within the the confines of the character and the moment. You can be serious and have fun. Um, but every actor will have his own motivation. Some people, oh, you, you're so good looking or you're so pretty. Um, you should be an actor. Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> um, and they follow up on it. The only problem with that is if that's your motivation, well, you've only got a few years. And it's tougher for women because um, there's less roles, you know, statistically as they grow older. You know, although I know some some women who are wonderful actresses um, who are my age or older. So they they really have the the gift of performing performing, but the calling for, for performing. It really has to be a very strong calling. It's like my wife, she's an RN. I don't know how she does it because she has to put up with Sometimes uh, a lot of crap because people are in pain or people in distress or people are diseased or whatever it may be. It takes a special a special person to to do that. Teachers also, you know, more more than five, I have a few friends who are teachers, um, and it seems more and more that. The tough part about the gig is not the kids because kids are kids and some are jerks and so on and so forth. It's the administration and the parents pressuring the administration and all these other pressures that you sh they shouldn't have. They should just be able to teach. Of course, there's bad teachers too, but they get weeded out. So you have to have a really special... And I, and I taught, not taught, I did a, a program in San Diego once from the Old Globe Theater it's called the in schools program. We would go to schools, high schools, junior highs. I'm sorry, because it's the most difficult time in a person's. You know, they're it's their teens or preteens. They're very insecure, so it's a really tough time. And a lot of them don't relate to academics. They don't out, uh, re relate to sports. But all of a sudden, theater gives them an outlet to speak, to be heard, to be understood. Um, and it's transformative. We had kids that were getting D's and F's, getting. B's and C's all of a sudden because somehow something got turned on in them. And, and you don't have to be an actor. You just, we all act, you know, uh, at different times of our lives. Like I said, I'm the husband sometimes. Sometimes I'm the narco. Sometimes I'm the killer. Sometimes I'm the, the father with my daughter. Uh, we're all different people at different times. So different people will have different motivations. At first, for me, it was the girls. <laughs> But then I really, really dug it. I dug the living crap out of it. And um, one thing led to another and it led to another. And then I came here and then I starved for a while. One time, literally, literally, I'm looking for pennies in the sofa cushions because I didn't have any money. Nothing. So you really have to have a strong calling to be an actor because the... You know, you're so good looking, you should be an actor or actress, will only last so long because you're not going to be young forever. Um, making a living is tough. People only focus on the, the millionaires. When they get to hear um, somebody who, you know, got paid $20 million, or they got points on the back, and all of a sudden they made 125 million off that movie, the A-listers. Well, that group is even smaller than the one percent of this nation, um, in, in terms of a, a, a ratio. Um, because most of us, we don't. I did. I've done dozens of plays for zero pennies. As a matter of fact, for a negative, because you still got to drive every day, and you. You know, you can only take a job that, that you can drop because what if you get this gig or that gig, um, which is why the, the stereotype of, of uh, actors being 
um, waiters. So chances are you'll starve. Like I've never told my daughter, um, I want you to be an actress or yeah, yeah. You know, I'll, you should be an actress because she's very pretty. Um, but she just doesn't want to do it. She's very shy. And I went to a couple auditions that she booked because I had to take her. And, you know, the, the director would say, well, what about your daughter? Um, and one of them, no, actually one of them she booked. And and the other one, I was at the callback and they said, well, what about your daughter? Uh, well, she didn't get the call. Oh, no, she got the callback and I didn't. And then when the camera started rolling, she was like six or seven, and she stand, She goes behind me and just holds on to me, and she was scared to death. So I, I thought, okay, I'm not going to push her. But it would have been great because, you know, you can pay off your college education, hopefully, if you get a few good commercials. And those are, those are few and far between. Um, it used to be you'd go physically to – I remember going to Universal – um and also fox and where we were auditioning all along the walls everywhere and on the desk piles and piles and piles of of pictures so and i read a statistic some some somewhere like some, uh, f like a 5000 to 1 for every one role that's hired there's like 5000 submissions would get which get you know, whittled down to, I don't know, four or 500 people that they're actually going to see. And then from those, the actual physical audition for the callback. And um, and that's a handful generally. And then the one guy or girl who gets the part. So the odds are stacked so far against you. And you say, well, somebody told me that I'm so pretty that I should go become an actress. Yeah. This is the land of pretty. The most beautiful women in the world are here. Uh, because there's a lot of also modeling. And um, so you walk in and you think you're you're the most beautiful, the ugliest, the most muscular, the most whatever, the best act. And there's 20 guys waiting that look just like you. Just like you. Uh, and those are just the ones that got whittled down. You know, wait till the, sometimes at the callback you get you see more people who look just like you. And sometimes no, sometimes I'll say, oh, well, let's get a skinny one, a fat one, and, or whatever their criteria may be for this character. Um, so in terms of making a, a, a living, it's tough. Uh, most people, you know, for some reason this five year plan got drilled into people's minds. And they'll say, well, if I don't make it in five years, and five years is obviously very concrete, but if I don't make it, what is making it? I never made it in, 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 in stereotypical terms. I was never a star, but I've worked a lot. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, I made it because, you know, I own a house. Um, I'm able to, my, my daughter's going through college right now. I'm able to pay for that because... Uh, we don't make enough to be independently wealthy and just send her anywhere, but not not enough to where, oh, she can get a scholarship or a FAFSA or whatever it may be. No, I'm paying for it. And it's tough. It's tough. But, but I'm blessed because, first of all, I'm bilingual. And, and not just bilingual, but bicultural. That's why I do a lot of narcos because I know the slang. I, I'm... I'm very very familiar with both worlds. I, that's why I say I'm, I'm bicultural, not bilingual. When I was in North Carolina in the Army, I was a good old boy. As somebody once told me, they said, I don't see you as Mexican. I see you as green. So, and then I go to Mexico, nobody knows that I'm from up here until I open my mouth and say something or they look at the, the plates on my truck. Um, so I can function in both in both worlds, and that is rare because a lot of people will have an accent in one or the other. It's rare, those of us who have no accent in need, because in Spanish I have no accent. I have more of, well, I have a, like a Northern Mexican accent. Um, so I'm lucky 
that I can do that because a good chunk of what I do is in Spanish or characters who are bilingual or living on the border or whatever on either side of it. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm blessed in that. Uh, and that's all my dad's doing because he insisted um, that my mom and dad were up here. He was doing, I forgot what. Uh, they emigrated legally and I was born here. And then he got an opportunity to, to produce picture frames. So he had the factories in Tijuana. And then over here, for some reason, we left to go to San Ysidro to take care of business over there. And then he was uh, defrauded and lost everything. So we, one of the factories, we were able to turn it into a house, or he was, um, and we lived there. So I grew up in both countries. I went to, to kindergarten and first and second here, and then third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and first of secondary in Mexico. And then I came back here to high school, and then I went to the Army, and then I came back here. And then I lived in Tijuana for a few years, and then I came up to Hollywood. So it's that's rare. Uh, most people don't have that um, that opportunity. I know a few who who are who you don't hear an accent in either language, and more importantly, they have the the um, the cultural connotations and everything they say. They they also can relate to things that. Uh, in both countries that some people can most people can't because it's either one or the other um so i've been blessed in that sense i'm very lucky um so mom and dad make sure your if your kids know spanish or you know spanish don't let them be lazy <laughs> yeah because also um also being bilingual i don't know if you know this but it um it opens up your mind to be a better mathematician and a musician because, because you're, you're used to dealing with different patterns. I can do most math in my head because I'm used to making sense of both languages in my head. Um, and that's, like I said, that's rare. So it's, it's tough. It's very tough. And even though things are changing, it's tough to be a Latino actor. Uh, it still is, because if you think about it, statistically, we are one, between one-sixth and one-seventh of the population of this country. I'll bet you, you don't see one out of six characters on TV or film that are Latinos, be they Puerto Rican, Chicano, Mexican-American, whatever, Cuban, whatever. I'll bet you, I'll bet you it's nowhere near that. I, I forgot who did a... A study on that and we're like three percent of roles and like two percent of leading roles and uh, jesus christ we're like 20, 20 approaching 25 percent of the population so yeah actually you know what well no here here in california so my point being um you don't see one in six characters on tv and or in a movie so we're still highly, highly underrepresented. So you've got that against you. Um, and just the statistics for anybody, it's really tough to make a living in this business. I always, um, I did the waiter rate. I was a bartender at the airport at LAX, which was a fun gig, by the way. <laughs> um, but I've also been, like I said, I think I mentioned this before. A life insurance salesman, you know, licensed. I've been, I still hold a real estate license. Um, I was a commodities broker, series three, and I was good too. I was a soybean king because I would study the market and everything. I could tell you at any given moment how deep the roots were in Illinois, in Argentina, in China. So if like a crop report, before the crop report came out and they came out with the weather, oh, we're going to have a drought. I knew how deep the roots were. I knew that they could withstand the drought, and I would tell my clients. Um, and then when the crop report came out, oh, we have a bumper crop. Ah, we would sell into that. So I made a lot of money for my for my clients. I could never do it for myself because I couldn't hammer people for you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I've done that. So I've done a lot of things that are very atypical because 
I realized a long time ago that I was getting older <laughs> and your back can't, you know, you can't carry an, another case of beer uh, or another two cases or whatever it may be, you know, busting your hump till three in the morning. Um, and I didn't want to bust my hump. I want a normal life. I want to. And as of about 20 years ago, um, I've been able to make a, a good living because I also do a lot of voiceover. Um, and be here for my daughter when she was going to school. I would take her and pick her up every day. And I would volunteer at school. And I would do a, a lot of, I, you know, when she was in, uh, what's it called, drill team? The uh, Not the drill team. Color guard with a marching band. I would drive the truck. Why? Because even, because most actors are unemployed 99% of the time. So I was able to to really enjoy my, my my daughter's youth and to see her grow up and and be a very um very big big part of that because um, like my wife for example she's a nine to five or Monday through Friday she's a nurse so she didn't get a lot of those stuff she's a great mother but she didn't get to, you know drop her off pick her up every day you know see that little look on her face what'd you learn that she'd have to wait until she got home and she was tired. So I, 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 it's, it's a blessing. It is a blessing. And most actors can't do that. They, they, they work the waiter gig and they give up and they think, you know what? This isn't for me. And, and I have a lot of friends who I contact them on Facebook and oh, I'm in Texas now. Oh, I'm in New York and I'm not acting or I'm in, I'm in wherever they gave up because they just want to do the five-year plan while, while they're still pretty. So know why, know, know why you want to be an actor, and the, then, then hold yourself to that, because um, it's a tough gig. It's a tough gig. Yeah, there's a lot of glamour, and there's a lot of money for some, but the vast majority of it, it's a tough gig.